Once the thing is able to read uh, a DC voltage, you have all kinds of uh, opportunities. I mean, the most obvious one is to use a pH meter to do uh, acid-base titrations. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. In the 1990s, Ed Meyer was a professor at DePaul University in Chicago, where he taught physical chemistry. In August 1990, the Journal of Chemical Education published his article, An Inexpensive Computer Station for Undergraduate Laboratories Using the Atari 800XL, in which Ed showed how to interface the Atari controller ports with a 12-bit analog-to-digital converter chip to do chemistry experiments. The article includes schematics and code in assembly language and BASIC. There's a link to that article in the show notes at ataripodcast.com. I'll read a bit from the article. The kind of interfacing that has been emphasized in chemical education thus far in this country has been largely limited to using the game paddle inputs of a home computer, which allows the connection of any device that looks like a variable resistor to the computer. This approach has served admirably as an introduction to the power and versatility of inexpensive home computers as data collectors and handlers, but suffers from significant disadvantages. The most obvious is the limitation to 8 bits of information, One would like to be able to obtain better precision than this provides. At half scale, we can expect roughly 1% reproducibility. Another is the requirement that the resistance of the transducer used be consistent with that of the game paddle it replaces. It is possible, without spending inordinate sums of money, to convert one of these home computers into a research-grade instrument with a resolution of 1 bit in 4096, if one knows a little about digital electronics. This article describes an interface for the Atari 800XL computer based on a 12-bit analog-to-digital converter. We have incorporated six of them into computer stations in our upper-track freshman laboratory. In general, the variables in question, for instance temperature versus time for coffee cup calorimeter experiments, pH versus volume titrant, are plotted in real time on the monitor screen, and after collection of the data, a hard copy of the plot is produced on a printer, along with a table of the data. We use similar stations in our physical chemistry laboratory, where more sophisticated curve-fitting routines are included. This interview took place on July 9th, 2018. At this point, you know, I'm 80 years old now, and so I've become philosophical. Uh, And uh, I think it's one of those cases where I I was forced into the wrong career. Mm. I always... I always loved music more than anything else. Uh, But my father uh, was not well-educated and he, he sort of equated musicians with immoral people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so the idea of my studying music was just, it just never came about. And I guess my second love was science. And, uh, When I got to the university, uh, the first calculus class I took, I got a C in. Uh, I guess that was probably in the second year uh, of college. And all the people who got A's in calculus were majoring in physics. And so I decided at that point that I was not going to major in physics uh, and the next best thing was chemistry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and physical chemistry was not that different from physics. So I focused on physical chemistry. Uh, and I was incredibly naive about things. I mean, people in my family just didn't go to college. And one at one point, the chairman of the chemistry department had me come in and he, I guess I was a senior. He asked me what I was going to do the next year. And I I said, I don't know. (laughs) I just, uh, you know, I was just sort of putting one foot in front of the other. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he said, well, what about graduate school? And I said, yeah, well, that sounds interesting. 
uh, and he had gone to Northwestern University, and DePaul University was in Chicago, and Northwestern was just uh, north of Howard Street uh, in Evanston. And so I said, okay. And so I applied to graduate school at Northwestern. And, you know, that's the only one <laughs> I applied to back in those days. Mm-hmm. Uh, life was a lot simpler. And I was accepted there. And uh, I studied heterogeneous catalysis under Professor Robert L. Burwell, who was an internationally recognized expert. And uh, the years I spent in his lab were really the most enjoyable of my professional life because no one expected me to do anything except my research uh, and study stuff that I was interested in. And, you know, and that's a tremendous luxury, I think. Uh, but I I told Professor Burwell that <laughs> I had uh, just got married. I, I I married Vicky the September that I started graduate school, and so I said I really don't want to spend any more time than necessary as a student. Uh, and also I was we. We both were Catholics at the time, and that pretty much meant we were going to start having a family mm-hmm. because we we bought the farm when it came to Catholicism. Uh, it took me quite a while to overcome the brainwashing I was subjected to, but eventually uh, I did. But uh, the the point was I really shouldn't, spend too much time in graduate school. So Professor Burwell gave me a project that he pretty much knew the answer to, but nobody had done it before. And so uh, I worked on it and I was able to finish up in three years. Uh, And then uh, again, the question came up, what am I going to do next? And uh, I applied for a NATO postdoctoral fellowship with Professor Charles Kemble, who was probably the equivalent of Professor Burwell in Europe. And he was at the Queen's University of Belfast. Uh, uh, Just as an aside, uh, my maternal grandparents were both born in Ireland. uh, But also very, no formal education whatsoever. And when my grandfather heard that I was going to go to Ireland to study, he was very interested uh, to hear what I was going to do. Uh, But as soon as he found out that I was going to Belfast, he scoffed and said, oh, the occupied zone, (laughs) and and lost lost all interest uh, in my career at that point. but anyway, we went. Uh, uh, I was awarded the postdoc, and we went. Uh, we went to Belfast for a year, uh, and then still, I after that year, I didn't really have any solid plans, and and uh, I took another postdoc at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington D.C. Uh, Let's see. Somewhere in there, uh, I did two years in the Army because when I was in college, I joined the ROTC because they they guaranteed me they wouldn't take me until I finished my uh, graduate studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think I think after the postdoc in Ireland, I went into the Army at uh, and I spent two years at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Maryland. And after that, I went to, I did the postdoc uh, at the Naval Research Lab for a couple of years. And then finally, uh, I got a job at DePaul University, which was school that I got my BS from. Uh, And I taught there for 30 years, physical chemistry. 
And in 1977, uh, they needed somebody to teach summer physical chemistry at Northwestern University. Uh, and uh, they accepted me to to do that job. And I did that for the last 20 years of my teaching life. Um, so I went, uh, I taught full-time at the school where I got my BS and I taught part-time at the school where I got my PhD. Um, so I didn't get around very much. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, without getting into, uh, how disappointed I was in, uh, the degeneration of students over the 30 years that I taught. I actually took an early retirement because I really, uh, I I couldn't accept what was happening uh, with the students. As a matter of fact, I wrote an an anonymous article for the Journal of Chemical Education uh, about why I was taking an early retirement. and I made it anonymous. I asked them to make it anonymous because I said things about my own university, which were not nice. And I was at the time working on an early retirement and I didn't want to jeopardize my chances for the, uh, for the early retirement. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is true that uh, I taught from 1967 until 19, 97. And there's absolutely no question that the quality of students was a monotonically decreasing function. And it uh, it wasn't only at DePaul. uh, You know, for the last 20 years, I was at Northwestern. uh, And the summer course I taught was one that pre-medical students at the time were required to take. Uh, and so that was a probably a higher than average sampling of students who took that course in the summertime, you know, to get rid of it. So they wouldn't have to take it while they were taking something important. Uh, but when I first started teaching the course, when I would arrive in the morning, there would be students lined up in the hall waiting to ask me questions about the homework or about the previous day's lecture or something like that. Uh, but 20 years later, I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> the people who wanted help, the numbers kept getting less and less. And by the time 97 rolled around, I mean, there was never anybody would come to see me who who was interested in, in learning something. Uh, I've never been able to figure out what was going on, but I think it's a general problem. And I just, uh, I set forth all the reasons why I was taking an early retirement in this. I think that was a 1994 uh, article in the Journal of Chemical Education. So I pretty much just... Uh, changed lives there when I retired Hmm. and I'm doing music mostly now. What instrument do you play? Well, I played the trumpet for a long time, but I came down with a horrible case of shingles, uh, which concentrated in my left eye and it left me with uh, a permanent though mild headache. Uh, and so I had to quit playing the trumpet because of that. Uh, and then I took up the piano. So now I'm, I play chords on the piano, you know, like out of a fake book. Mm -hmm. And we have a, we have a jazz session every Sunday for a few hours. Uh, and, uh, when I played the trumpet, I had my own Dixieland band, which was a great kick for me. Uh, and, uh, I have sung in a barbershop quartet almost continuously since since the 60s, and I'm, I'm still doing that also. 
Wonderful. That's the background. Great. <laughs> okay, so I would like to talk about this article that you wrote. Um, I would like to know how you started using the computer in the laboratory and about this teaching students to use a computer to uh, do experiments, the kind of experiments you did. Just tell me how you got to this article. Well, uh, it all started when my, we have uh, six children and my oldest was in high school. He told me that I have to buy a computer, you know, and there, you know, this is when there were no computers. Uh, and he convinced me to buy an Atari that, you know, it had one of those membrane plastic things over the top of it. It uh-huh. probably was the first, first Atari that was ever made. Yeah. Uh, and that really was the beginning of things. And, uh, they, my sons, uh, all four of my sons, uh, are physics majors. They have PhDs in physics. And, uh, and, oh, I should also say that I don't take any credit for that. The fact is that the high school they went to, Evanston Township High School, had an absolutely charismatic physics teacher. And he he just uh, overwhelmed my sons. <laughs> they all became <laughs> physicists. Uh, and they had a friend who was really into computers, uh, who was doing things in machine language. And so my kids really are the ones that got into the computer way before I did. Uh, but but that really was the beginning. Uh, and that was in the 80s, must have been the early 80s, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, that was it. And then computers got to DePaul uh, much later, and the idea of word processing was a, was a brand new thing, you know, the idea that uh, you could actually make a change in a document without starting the whole, you know, without retyping the whole document, that was a... Mm-hmm. That was an earth-shaking uh, improvement. Uh, I don't, uh, and the university bought us all Zeniths. We all had a Zenith computer on our desk where we would write letters and save things and stuff like that. Uh, I don't really remember uh, how I got into the interfacing thing. I know that I got help from people in the physics department, friends of mine in the physics department. And I got a lot of help from that, the kid who who wrote the machine language for that very first Atari. Uh, my sons kept them, they still keep in touch with this guy. Uh, and he was the, the guru I could turn to whenever I got really stuck, I would call him uh, and he helped me out. Uh, well, I actually did everything myself and and understood everything, but I would not have been able to do it uh, without help. Um, uh, I remember uh, getting one of those. You know, I just tried to find a an inexpensive older computer, and that Atari what was it an eight hundred XL. Mm-hmm. That's right. That was one. That was one that was out there, and so that was the one uh, that I focused on. I got myself a little tiny TV set that I used for uh, a monitor, uh, and I just put in many, many hours having fun. You know, putting one foot in front of the other, uh, and uh, eventually the thing actually worked and. I did, I made up six stations, com- six computer stations. Uh, so we had six Ataris and uh, six little TVs for monitors and six uh, disk drives uh, that we could set up. And of course, you know, once the thing is able to read uh, a DC voltage, you have all kinds of uh, 
opportunities to use it. I mean, the most obvious one is to use a pH meter to do uh, acid-base titrations. And the computer is great because it remembers everything, and it's got a essentially a perfect clock in it, uh, and you don't have to write anything down. You know, I mean, everything is in the computer. Uh, I remember one experiment uh, that I had the students do was uh, I included a, a least squares program in the basic language in the experiment. And uh, I found out that if you, you know, when you use a pipette, I mean a burette, you know, when you do a titration, you have this burette, which has milliliter markings on it. And if you draw the point of the burette down so that it has a very narrow opening, the rate of flow of a titrant out of the burette is a exact function uh, of, I think, this, it's the square or the square root of the height of liquid in the burette. So what I did was tell the students to hit a button every time the level in the burette went past a milliliter mark. And and so maybe for 20 milliliters, there'd be 20 data points. Uh, and they could then fit a curve that would relate the time in the computer to the volume delivered. So, so the time was measured exactly. And the volume delivered was incredibly accurate. So they could do a titration uh, with very high accuracy with this this burette and the Atari computer. I thought that was uh, very satisfying to be able to do that. Uh, that was a freshman experiment that we did uh, with the Atari. Um, another experiment that I thought was neat was there is a, uh, if you take a, a large flask uh, with maybe three liters of a gas in it, you can buy a precision bore tube, maybe three quarters of an inch in diameter. And it comes with a stainless steel ball that fits snugly in this uh, in this uh, cylindrical tube. So I put the tube in the in on the top of this container and you drop this ball into the tube and it bounces up and down. Well, uh, it's easy to connect a pressure transducer into the system. And so while this ball is bouncing up and down, the computer is measuring the pressure as a function of time. And it turns out the uh, you can do, you can derive a thermodynamic equation that gives you the ratio of the constant pressure heat capacity to the constant volume heat capacity of whichever gas uh, the ball is bouncing up and down on. Uh, and so I had students put nitrogen in there and they could measure the heat capacity ratio for nitrogen. And I had them use argon and I had them use CO2. These are three fundamentally different kinds of molecules. Argon is monatomic, uh, nitrogen is diatomic, and the carbon dioxide is, of course, triatomic. And well, without getting into any details, it was a, a nifty, very simple experiment that uh, the Atari was good at. Um, let's see. Well, also, also you could hook a uh, a temperature measuring device up to the thing. Uh, and so it would measure temperature as a function of time. And one of the classical uh, physical chemistry experiments is making up a mixture of two compounds that you can, uh, that melt somewhere not too high above room temperature and measuring cooling curves of the uh, different mixtures. And then you construct a phase diagram uh, from the cooling curves. 
Uh, and that was one of the experiments that we did. Uh, I think we published that in the Journal of Chemical Education also. And you can, all, when you do a cooling curve, uh, a cooling curve provides a way of measuring the purity of a compound. If you have a compound that's almost 100% pure, you can get a very good estimate of its exact purity by doing uh, a very accurate uh, cooling curve. And that's something else that we could do with the Atari. Wow. So did you <laughs> did you have custom programs, uh, custom basic programs to do each of these things? Or did you just kind of use the generic code that you published in this particular article to do each of those experiments? Um, well, writing the code for the experiments really was not difficult at all. I mean, uh, once, once the basic program for booting up the system was available, then uh, that was used all the time. Uh, so uh, as I remember it, this, we had a boot up disk, and the first thing a student would do would be just to boot up the system. And then once it was booted up, you could just use, you know, uh, enter uh, the basic language for that experiment. And... Uh, you know, I mean, I wrote all that stuff, but it was it was not difficult to do. <laughs> Very interesting. It was fun. I really enjoyed it. How long, how many years do you think you used the Atari computers in this way? Oh, well, if I published it in 90... I was probably using it by the time it was published and I retired in 97. So about, about seven years was, uh, was the extent of it. Wow. Which is, you know, that, that's, that's pretty good. I mean, it was, it was practically obsolete by the time, uh, the article was published. I mean, everything mm -hmm. was changing so fast at the time. Uh, when I started making it, there just was nothing available. Uh, but, you know, by the time I made it or not too long after that, I'm sure you could buy uh, a system, you know, buy a setup that was built to do this kind of a thing. Right. But uh, I never looked into it because I had my Ataris. It was certainly obsolete by... 1990 through 1997, but it was an inexpensive solution, I think, to your problem. That's right. Yeah, uh, I think that was the main uh, uh, positive aspect of it, was you didn't have to spend an arm and a leg uh, to be able to do some very powerful things. And also to get, I mean, to have the students realize that this is the wave of the future. You know, I mean, uh, they had to, uh, 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 each student had a disc, that, you know, a floppy disc that was part of their, their lab notebook. And, and they would transfer data from uh, the, uh, the disc that came out of the Atari. Uh, they would put into the Zenith somehow, and I had some kind of software that would uh, convert the Atari stuff into uh, whatever it was that the Zenith read, and then mm -hmm. we had we had Lotus uh, one two three. I think was the what do you call those programs? Spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, spreadsheet. Yeah, we had spreadsheet programs, and so the students learned how to uh, handle spreadsheets also as part of the experience and. Uh, that certainly is something that, that they would be using again, I would think. So I thought it was a, a terrific advantage uh, for the students. <laughs> nice. They didn't necessarily think so. <laughs> did, uh, did you or the students ever uh, plug in some Pac-Man and play video games on those machines? 
No, I didn't. I, <laughs> I didn't even know what they were. Uh, uh, and they only they didn't have access to these things. I actually had to set them up and take them down every time we had a lab. So it was uh, it was very time intensive for me because we didn't have lab space that we could dedicate to these things. Oh. So I had what I had was six, uh, you know, the cartons that reams of paper come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I could put everything that pertained to an experiment into one of those boxes. So I had six of those boxes. And every time we ran a lab, I had to get the boxes out and set up six stations. And after the lab was over, I had to take the six stations down and put them back in the boxes. Did those... <laughs> what I didn't do for those students. <laughs> Did those computers stay at DePaul after you retired? No. Uh, I'm not sure. I really don't know what happened uh, to those things, but I'm sure they don't exist anymore. Uh, I didn't. I didn't bring them with me, and really, I was the only one uh, in the department who who really could do it. There wasn't anybody else mm-hmm. uh, who had the know-how to do it. So it was just a it was a seven-year occurrence, a seven-year blip. Did Did you get any feedback from people who read your uh, article in the journal? No, <laughs> hmm. not, I'm not aware of one. And I do remember, I do remember uh, putting my phone number in there because I did say that, the, you know, the most important thing to have available is somebody who knows how to do it, you know, that you can ask a question when you get stuck. And uh, I'm pretty sure I put my own phone number in the article. Yes, you did. Uh, uh, but... I don't remember ever getting a call from anybody. Hmm. It was it was a big deal, you know. I mean, for somebody to do all that would take a lot of dedication. Uh, so it's not, it's not very surprising, really. You described three experiments very thoroughly. Thank you. Do you remember any others? Uh. Uh, we may have done a heat of mixing. You know, you have take two chemicals, and when you mix them together, they produce heat. Uh, that's that's probably another one that we did. Uh, mm, it was such a long time ago. Yes, I understand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just thought of another experiment that we did. Tell me. <laughs> in PCAM lab, uh, we we measured the surface area of charcoal by measuring an adsorption isotherm. Uh, and that was another example of an experiment using a pressure transducer. Uh, you would, we would measure the pressure volume and temperature of a gas before exposing it to a charcoal surface, and then after exposing it to the surface, and from the the ideal gas law and the pressure volume temperature data, you could calculate how much of the gas originally present was stuck on the surface because the you know uh, the stuff that went on the surface was no longer a gas. Uh, and there's something called the BET theory, which is for Brunauer, Emmett, and Teller. Uh, Teller is the same guy that worked on the hydrogen bomb. Uh, uh, and they worked out a, a theory for calculating the surface area of the charcoal based on the the, the uh, isotherm that was produced uh the isotherm was the 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 amount of gas on the surface 
as a function of the pressure of the gas above the surface. And if you know that, the BET theory allows you to calculate the surface area of the charcoal. And in, uh, in the catalysis business, knowing the surface area is probably one of the most fundamental things uh, that you need about a particular catalyst. Uh, and uh, so the Atari was useful to get that uh, measuring isotherms. Hmm. Uh, so it sounds yeah. like you use the Atari for data collection, but for visualization of the data, you moved it. You moved the data to one of your Zenith machines. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, uh, and the output from the spreadsheet would really visualize it. I had I bought some Atari little Atari printers uh, that when I first. Uh, started using it, mm-hmm. I had the students use, each student had a little printer, which was cute, mm-hmm. <laughs> but they really, they were not robust. <laughs> and, and you know, getting the pens to write and everything was kind of a problem. Uh, and so we pretty quickly uh, got rid of the printers and just collected the data and then put them into the Zenith and, uh, and use the spreadsheet to draw the graphs. Uh, that was a lot more reliable. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think what I have, what I think I have what I need. Thank you so much, Ed. Okay. Not a problem. I'm glad to hear somebody's still interested. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they're still fun and useful machines. You know, that some people today are playing games with them. Some of them are still writing little applications and and s- things like this. Little hardware uh, projects are easy. So, you know, way, way easier than using modern equipment. So... Well, my, one of my sons was a big uh, Atari fan. As a matter of fact, uh, I think I gave him all my Atari books, you know, mm-hmm. when, when I retired. Uh, uh, and I think he actually taught, his, he has two daughters, and one of them is sort of a, a math kid, and I'm sure he taught her Atari Basic as soon as she was old enough to uh, to appreciate it. Nice. So he's one of those people who's enchanted with the Atari. <laughs> Maybe I should talk to him next. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let me know if you want to. Yeah. Uh, Last question. If you could send a message to the Atari computer users who are still who still exist, what would you tell them? Ooh, I don't know. I'm. Uh, I would just uh, hope that they're still having as much fun as I had when I when I worked with the Atari. It was a fun thing. It was a. Uh, it was an enjoyable period of my life to get to know how that thing worked. As much as I did, I mean, uh, I'm sure I just scratched the surface, but still, it was a very enjoyable experience great thank you ed okay well thanks for your time if you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute there are two ways you can help you can help fund these interviews directly by contributing to my Patreon. A small monthly contribution will help offset the expenses of making these oral history interviews. Contribute at patreon.com slash savits. Or make a tax-deductible contribution to the Internet Archive, a nonprofit digital library that has done incredible things to preserve computer history. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org slash donate. Thanks.